Welcome to the I Want to Know podcast. I'm Josh Spector, and I'll be your host. If you don't know who I am, I'm the creator of the For the Interested newsletter, which you can check out at fortheinterested.com. If you're new here, this podcast exists to help creative entrepreneurs get their questions answered. And here's how it works. Basically, in each episode, a different guest comes on and asks me three questions. We have about a five-minute conversation about each of them, and that's it. No fluff, lots of actionable tips you can put to use and try to give you the most bang for your buck, your buck being your time. Today, my guest is joining us from the UK. Her name is Fab Giovanetti. Fab is an award-winning author, entrepreneur, and marketing consultant who helps professionals reclaim their time. She's the CEO of Alt Marketing School, where she supports people making a positive impact through their marketing. You can check that out at altmarketingschool.com. And she's been featured in the Next Web, Business Insider, Forbes, among others. As a speaker and through her online consulting, she's touched over 100,000 people from all over the world. So with that in mind, hey, Fab, welcome to the show. Hello. Thank you for having me. It's really cool in here. I'm enjoying it already. <laughs> nice. You've done a fantastic job so far. It's your, you might, <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, you might be my favorite guest so far of the, <laughs> of the episodes that I've recorded in your first 30 seconds here. But I am really excited to talk with you. And especially because, you know, a lot of what, a lot of what I'm doing on this show is very specific, very tactical advice. And this will be that, but I think on a sort of a broader, deeper kind of mindset approach level, I know those are the, the kind of questions you had for me. So it'll be a little different and you're going to for, not force me, but you're going to get me to talk about things that maybe I don't always talk about. So it should be interesting. So with that in mind, let's, let's get into it. What is the first thing you want to know? Josh. I want to know what was something that you unlearned in recent years that improved the quality of your life? This is, this is a good question. This is a tricky question. I really had to think about it because it required me, what I think is interesting about this question and probably good for everyone to think about is the first part was I had to kind of think, well, what are things that I had previously learned or believed? And then think about what do I maybe no longer believe or have unlearned or sort of my, my thoughts on that have shifted. So I'm going to give you some of my answer and then I'm going to throw it back to you to find out like why you were curious to know that. So I, I'll put you on the spot in a moment. But what I thought about or what first came to mind was for a long time, and, and I, my answer is going to apply to both my life and my business, I think. For a long time, I saw things as very black and white. I was very sure in what I believed was right or wrong, what I believed was the sort of smart way to do something or the dumb way to do something. I was very concrete in the kind of person I was. Oh, I'm the kind of person that does that. I don't, I'm not the kind of person that does that. Everything was, there wasn't any gray area. Right. Every the world, business, my own life, my own decisions, everything seemed very sort of crystal clear to me. And I think for a long time that really helped me. Like, I think that was actually a very good thing from a very young age. I sort of knew or believed I knew who I was, what I wanted. I, it gave me a lot of confidence, I think, in all sorts of things in my own abilities, in the decisions I made, in the people I surrounded myself with, all of that stuff. It was almost like I had the answers to everything, right? So anything that would come my way or any decisions, I could be like, all right, well, it's either, again, black or white, yes or no, like, okay, this is clear. And I think for a lot of things, I didn't, in many ways, I didn't exactly understand why other people seem to struggle so much with life or business. I was like, well, I, why, what do you mean you don't know what you want to do or you're unsure? Or what, like, I was very certain. And again, it had, there were a lot of benefits to that. What I found, and I'd say this evolved over the past decade, maybe five to 10 years, something like that, is, you know, that approach is great until you start to realize you're wrong about some stuff, 
So all of a sudden, not all of a sudden, but gradually as you get older and you have more experiences and you see more stuff and some of those decisions and some of those certainties you start to realize, well, wait a second. Like I thought if you do X, Y, and Z that this happens, but that's not what happened. And I thought that, you know, this, this person that I thought was crazy for doing it that way, maybe they weren't so crazy. And you start to realize that, th or at least I started to realize things are, uh, things are much more complicated than they may seem and, or may have seemed to a younger version of me. So I definitely shifted from sort of that black and white to now I see almost every, it's almost polar opposites. I, you know, and that's to what I've unlearned. I now see almost everything as shades of gray. I understand the, you know, it's funny. One of the things I say to clients and creators all the time when we're talking about how to figure out what they want to do and I'm, I'm consulting with them is a lot of times one of the first things I'll say is like, look, we're not trying to find, there's no one right path. There's infinite paths and infinite ways you can succeed and get what you want. So it's not about finding the right path because I think people get paralyzed looking for that. It's about picking a path and then figuring out how to make it right. That, if you think about it in the context of this, suggests gray area. It doesn't suggest there's a right way and a wrong way. It's black and white, right? You need to do it this way. And that I think is very representative of the shift that I've gone through. Also separating, there's a great book I read by Annie Duke, and I am going to butcher the name of it because I don't remember. But it is, hold on, I'm actually going to look it up. It's weird to give her a book recommendation and not uh, actually recommend the name of the book. Okay, so the book is called Thinking in Bets. And Annie Duke is a professional poker player. It's not about poker, but it's really about decision making. And, you know, a lot of that book is about understanding that like people tend to judge their decisions based on the outcome. And just because the outcome either turns out good or bad doesn't mean it was a good or bad decision. Those things are completely separate. So that has, that has influenced this. And again, that's something that leads to this sort of gray area versus right, you know, strict right or wrong. The benefits of, I think, now that I've sort of come out on the other side and shifted my perspective or to use your term, unlearned some of this is I think it has made me much more patient, both with myself and with others, much less frustrated because when you see things black and white, it was very frustrating for me, for people that didn't, I didn't understand how people couldn't see things the way I saw them. I was like, oh, it's so clear. How are you not getting this or, you know, whatever. So much less frustrated. And I also think it's removed a lot of pressure around decisions and things like that. Because if you really feel like there's a definitive right or wrong answer or choice, inevitably you're going to put a lot of pressure on yourself to make that right decision, right? To not screw it up. When you understand that, you know, that things are gray, it relieves a lot of that, a lot of that pressure. And I think, and then finally, I think it's helped me see more perspectives, understand other people's perspectives better and see how things can be complicated. And I think that those things, that piece of it has actually made me a better marketer a better writer, that ability to sort of understand the subtleties and the complexities of things is really helpful in terms of any kind of communications, especially selling and, and you know, the communicating of ideas. So that's a little rambly, but that, that's what I would say I have unlearned. So before we go to the next question, I am going to throw it back in you. And I'm just curious, why was that one of the questions that you wanted to ask? So first of all, I just want to add one point, and I like one thing that you said that because it really resonates with me in a positively painfully way, if possible. I am exactly the same. I used to know exactly what I wanted to do all the time. I'm the next step. And as you say, it can be hard when you're talking to others. For me, clients are students, and they don't know what to do next. And I was like, well, how can you know? And I think, it's, as you say, it's really humbling to actually not appreciate that gray area. And as you say, explore as well. I love that. And it goes back to the reason why I chose this question. So first of all, that I shall not take credit is an excellent question that one of my guests on our podcast at Walmart Marketing mm -hmm. School asked me, JJ, 
Uh, shout out to JJ Reston. Mm-hmm. And I love this so much. I was like, I'm going to write this thing down because I think I'm going to ask her again in the future. And uh, I just loved it because it shifts perspective, talking about shifts of perspective that you just mentioned. And it kind of makes you think about, we always think about the things that we learned or that we improved, the things that we added. But sometimes the way in our mindset, or I love that you mentioned even experimenting in our strategy, that we can shift mm-hmm. and try can teach us so much, as much as learning something new, doing something new, adding something. Sometimes removing it or changing it can actually, as you say, also improve the quality of our life. Again, stress, frustration, it can happen so often. Yeah. That's the reason why I really loved it. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. And I'm glad you mentioned that because it fits right in line with the way I think about a lot of things, like the removal of stuff being as important And a lot of times, even more so than the adding of stuff, right? I'm always looking to simplify, to clarify, to remove things. This podcast is an example of that. Let me just sort of, we're going to do three questions. We're going to talk about them for, you know, a few minutes and, and that's going to be it as opposed to a lot of stuff that's sort of over, overdone. Cool. So speaking of which, let's get to your second question. What else do you want to know? Talking about brief. I want to know, Josh, what is something you can teach us right now in one minute? And I'm not even time you. <laughs> Great. I'll, t- I'll, t- I'll, t- I'll talk quickly. So I, it's funny. I, my first thought was, let me come up with one sort of specific thing. But instead of doing that, I'm going to give a sort of broad thing and give a bunch of rapid, <laughs> rapid fire stuff you can do, right? So uh, I, I might as well swing for the fences. What I'm going to teach you in one minute is how to be a stronger writer. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to give a few very specific, very simple things. And it's interesting. It fits with our previous question because a lot of these have to do with removing things as opposed to adding things. So it, it fits in well. So here's a handful of things you can anybody can do whether you're a great writer or a terrible writer, it doesn't matter. It will make you a stronger writer and make whatever you're writing better. So here we go. Start the clock. First thing, you should always have a goal for everything you write, whether it's blog posts, whether it's emails, whether it's a sales page, whether it's a social media post, whatever it is, you're writing it because there's something you're trying to accomplish. And if you don't know what you're trying to accomplish going into it, it's unlikely that you're going to accomplish it, right? Now, that may be to get the person who's reading it to take an action. It may be just for yourself. I'm trying to clarify my own thinking. I'm trying to whatever. But you should know why you're writing it, right? If you're sending an email, there's something you want to happen as a result of that email. So first thing is make sure you have a goal. The second thing, delete. you can delete the word that from just about any sentence and it makes the the sentence stronger. So simple, works every time. You'll be amazed. You'll realize, wow, I didn't really need to include that. So no pun intended. Delete the word that. Another thing is when possible, usually try to avoid words that end in ing. So instead of a sentence that says you're working, you're thinking, you're whatever, try to use work or think. Structure the sentence in that way and it will make it much stronger. Another thing is there's a lot of phrases that we use as that's that I call them softeners. They soften our writing things like, I think I believe after all, all that does is soften your statement. If you're writing it, we know you think it, we know you believe it. So you can always look to sort of eliminate those phrase that phrases that are softening your point. The next one, and this is my absolute favorite one guaranteed to work. Uh, you know, my favorite writing tip of all time. When you think you're done and you're about to publish something, do a word count and then force yourself to delete at least 10% of the words. Even better if you delete 20%. It will always make what you've done a million times stronger. And that approach, when most people edit, they're, they're looking at it going, thinking about can they afford to lose it? versus I have to remove 10%. Let me figure out what the worst, what the, the, le- the least necessary 10% is. Always works. And then the last one would be just in general about tone. Write like a person. Don't write like a company or an academic. Informal is always better than formal. 
your goal is to communicate and connect with people, no matter what you're doing. Too many people are trying to sound impressive when really what you want to aim for is sort of clarity and simplicity and sound real. So that might be more than a minute, but hopefully I just made you a stronger writer in a minute. I mean, it's probably a bit more, but I think we can let you off because we'll break for some advice. So right. I think we can let you off. Thank you. One. So I'm going to do one more, right? So let me ask you a question. If I could teach you anything, we're going to improv one here. If I could teach you anything in a minute, what would you want to learn in a minute? What I want to learn in a minute? Um, Not me, hopefully. Gosh, the... So hopefully it's something. If, it, if, if you say gardening, I'm not going to be much help. <laughs> I was thinking about quantum physics. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. You know what? I think for me, because, and I'm not saying this just because I'm on the podcast. Okay. I'm a big fan of your work Thank and the newsletter. And even if part of my job is actually to do marketing, one of the things that I love is the way that you created that consistency mm -hmm. and some of the systems that I can see behind the scenes. Again, I'm not marketing, I'm a scientist, so I see these things. Mm -hmm. so that's what I would love, you know, that's what I would love. I love to understanding how things work behind the scenes to mm -hmm. make it more efficient, but also to make it effortless. So that will be probably not a minute. Okay. <laughs> well, uh -huh. I'll buy you. I'll give you, how about this? So I'll do a one minute version of how I've been able to publish my newsletter for every week for 314 weeks in a row or whatever it is. So here's the key. I, I use Workflowy, which is an app. It's an incredibly simple app that's literally just like bullet lists and you can just put in whatever you want and you can embed one list in another. So throughout the week, anytime I come across stuff, right? articles that are interesting, podcasts I listen to, tweets, whatever it is. And I'm like, oh, this might be a good fit for my newsletter. I literally just copy and paste a link into that, into this workflowy thing. So I don't set aside time specifically to go find content. My newsletter has the same format every week. I'm not reinventing the wheel. That makes it much easier to be consistent. I'm not like, what am I going to write about this week? No, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to curate stuff. So when I sit down to go write it, I've already, I have a document with hundreds and hundreds of things that I found because whenever I find something, I add it there. So all I have to do is pick out the five I want to share or what, you know, whatever I want to share. I know the format, so I don't have to think about that. The format is relatively short and simple. It's like a one, a headline and like a one sentence summary with a link in terms of my like Sunday newsletter. So that's not complicated. I know I'm basically doing the same thing sort of over and over again with different content. I know clearly who my audience is. It's creative entrepreneurs. And I know I want to share stuff with them that helps them grow their audience in business. Those foundational, and I'm talking about a newsletter, but this applies for anything. You can see it, what I'm doing with the podcast too, right? There is a formula, right? I'm going to have someone on. They're going to ask me three questions. This is what it's going to be. I don't have to do, you know, all sorts of like the, the foundation to be consistent. You want to set yourself up for consistency. You want to make it easy to be consistent. The fewer decisions that you have to make, the easier it is to repeatedly do stuff. So I, by, by structuring it the way I've structured it, that allows me to be really consistent without it feeling like this massive thing, right there, you know, there are the other thing I would say just about consistency as relates to my newsletter, but with all, with all sorts of things, people go like, wow, how do you, you know, how do you do it for that long? And how do you not miss a week? Well, number one, it's something that I like to do. I'm not dragging myself to do it every week. You know, don't choose to do things that you hate to do. Tough to be consistent at something you hate to do. And then the other thing I would say is that if you think about in the big picture, so if I'm doing 52 Sunday newsletters a year, right? There's probably only going to be a handful, you know, maybe five at five weeks at most that I'm really busy or I don't feel good or whatever, that it's a struggle. So the difference between me doing it every week is not 52 weeks of struggle. It's what do I do those five weeks a year that... I'm busy, I'm traveling, I'm whatever, right? Those five weeks make the difference between publishing every week and not and spinning the other way. So I think that's the other thing to think about with consistency is 
it's actually a little easier than you think to be consistent when you realize it's only a handful of times that it's going to be a quote unquote struggle. So yeah, that's a little more than a minute on how to be consistent, but hopefully. I think we all need a bit more of a reminder of how, I think it's just breaking it down the way you did remind mm. us that actually is the small decisions that we make. And again, I must have kept for like those small decisions that help us creating something that also is familiar for our audience, which we underestimate and you talked about it also when it comes to the writing tips. Yep. People know there's us, they don't know what to expect. It makes them happy. It makes our life easier. Yeah. Make it, make it easier on yourself, right? It's amazing how often people make things tougher on themselves than it needs to be. I, there's no way I would have published a newsletter every week if every week I had to sit down and go, what am I going to write about this week? It just wouldn't happen. Okay, so let's get to your third question. What is the third thing you want to know? Today, the final thing I want to know, please and thank you, is what is the most unexpected lesson your business has taught you, Judge? You're also my most polite guest so far with your with your please and thank yous. I like it. You would never get stuck telling, would you? <laughs> okay, so unexpected lesson. I think that there have probably been, it's funny, like I've learned a lot of things. I've been full-time sort of independent consultant for about six years now. My business has certainly evolved. I learn all sorts of things. And one of the things that I think kind of runs across all of it, or one of the, that is sort of a theme is you have way more control than you realize. And I think this is true certainly as like an independent entrepreneur, but I also think it's true. And I realized it over the years, you know, I spent 20 plus years working as an employee for various companies and you have more control in that situation than you realize as well. But I think it's especially evident and, and sort of a different way when you, when you work for yourself. And when I say you have more control, what I mean is you have more control over your schedule than you realize. You have more control over the services or products you offer. You have more control over the prices you offer. You have more control over every element of your business and your work and your day than you probably realize. And, and this is something I've certainly learned over the years. And it, it's, I was thinking about kind of why that was unexpected. And, and what I think is really interesting, and this is something that I went through, and I think lots of people who work for themselves or have their own business go through as well. What's interesting is people go into business for themselves a lot of times because they want control and freedom. I don't want to have to answer to a boss. I want to structure my day how I want to structure it. I want to work on the projects that I want to work on. All of that stuff, right? That's a big part of why they go into it. But then once they go into it, they don't take advantage of any of those things. And in a lot of times, they actually punt a lot of the, they wind up with less control than they had working for someone or working for a company, right? And the reason they don't take advantage of it is because they don't feel like they can. They go from having one boss to, let's say they're working with clients, they go from having one boss to having five clients who all, who are as, who they treat like those five clients are their boss. So what winds up happening is they start to feel pressure to make things work on their own, which leads them to give up even more control. Oh, but if I, I want clients or I need clients, I have to do calls when the client's ready. And I have to, you know, I can't, I have to take any job that comes my way because what if another job doesn't, you know, what if there's not another job around the corner? And, and it's just, it's fascinating. And I, I certainly fell victim, not fell victim to this, but I think I had some of this mindset initially, like, you know, in the early days, I never sat down and said, this is how many people I want to or can work with a month. It was like, if 10 people happened to contact me and wanted to hire me, great. I guess I'm working with 10 people this month, right? Like there was no, like, this is too much. I had no, now there's a waiting list. I schedule stuff out. Now I'm very deliberate about this is the way I want to do this. This is how much work I can take on. This is who I want to work with. These are the, you know, also in the early days, it was like, I have a variety of skills and I would, 
Anybody that I could help with something, I would do it. Oh, you need Facebook ads? I can run Facebook ads for you. Great. Oh, you need someone to ghostwrite your social posts? I could do that. Great. Right? So I was doing all these different things, not necessarily focused on the things that I wanted. I didn't like doing Facebook ads. And at some point I eventually learned like, why am I doing this? Like I don't, and that's what I mean about the sort of taking back control. And now, you know, when people want to hire me or book a consulting call, I have a specific number of people I work with each month. And so if you want to hire me and I'm booked for the month or the next month, or, you know, we might schedule three months from now. And there, not only is there nothing wrong with it, it's a good thing. It makes me, my work better, my clients better. It's better for everybody. But I do think it relates to control. And I'm fascinated, not just with me, but with so many people who they work for themselves because they want that control, but then they feel like they don't actually have it. And that's an, that's an illusion. That's something that I have definitely learned. You know, even little things, right? Like now... If someone wants to schedule a call, I used to go, when's good for you? Now, now it's like, how about this time? This time's good for me. And they may agree, they may not, but it's interesting the degree to which people, especially who work for themselves after leave, you know, going to work for themselves because they want that control. And then they're very quick to just completely give it up to every, everyone else. So that has been a massive change and probably an unexpected lesson because I didn't realize when I first started doing this, I assumed, great, now I have control of freedom of my own time. And it took me a while to realize, but wait, I'm not actually doing that. Like, <laughs> like I'm doing what everyone else wants. So that would be the big thing. And I, I would say to people, especially people who work for themselves, like take a look at how you're operating and to what degree you are actually controlling and doing what you want to do. Don't be scared that you can't take control. I actually have found that things get much better in my business. Again, for me and my clients and every, you know, my audience, the more control I sort of take and the more boundaries and parameters I set up. That would be my answer. Does that make sense? Have you heard that before in people you talk to? Oh, Josh, I mean, I wish I could say no, but I was actually going to add something because I love this. Yeah. It's actually like one of the things that I noticed the most is that when I talk about boundaries and I have a lot of people that actually from reading my book, just called Reclaim Your Time Off, mm -hmm. the context, boundaries and what you just said, setting expectations is the biggest challenge that they have. And when you challenge that, when readers went through the questions that I had in the book, they were like, I realized that a lot of the expectations, as you said, being always available, be available at certain times, commitment to work. It was themselves that first put that pressure on themselves. And once they set new boundaries and communicated with people, most of the time, not always, people will understand that. If that's the options that you give them, people will find a way to accommodate yeah. or let you know if they can't. But it really happens. And I heard from what you said, it happened to you as well. Once you told people how things were yeah. going to work, People will adapt in that way, but it's that fear of doing it first that so many people told me was their block. So yeah, it's funny. Like I actually realized after I started doing it where it seems so obvious in retrospect, right? But it's like, if someone contacts me to hire me and I say, I'm booked for the next, two, I'd love to work with you. I'm booked for the next two months. That doesn't make them less likely to hire me. It makes them more likely, right? It makes me look good and in demand versus going, oh, you want to hire me? Great. Let's start tomorrow. Like the, the, the concept that like saying that is somehow going to make you look worse. It's only going to make you look stronger. I'm not saying to lie and say it, but like assuming it's legitimate, it's not a bad thing for people to understand that, that you're busy. Cool. Well, thank you so much for this. Before we wrap up, is there anything that you want to plug or people want to know more about you, learn from you, where should they go? First of all, thank you for having me. I do enjoy asking people questions and getting <laughs> lots of goodness. So I hope the listeners had the same experience. Yeah, if you just want to find that more, I would say two quick points that I made. I do have a book called Reclaim Your Time Off. You can find it out everywhere. It's available. So if you want to learn how to stop overworking, that would be a great solution. And if you want to find out more about me and what we do, you can go to fabgiovanetti.com, which is F-A-B-G-I-O-V-A-N-E-T-T-I. 
And you can find out more about my work and also all the marketing school and what we do with that as well. Great. Thank you. And for anyone that wants to know more about me, here's the the slew of stuff you can get from me. For starters, definitely get my newsletter for the interested.com slash subscribe. It's free. I do a series of video workshops called Skill Sessions. You can get those at joshspector.com slash sessions. If you want some one-on-one help and want to hire me for a coaching call or consulting, check out joshspector.com slash consulting. I am super active on Twitter. So if you are too, connect with me there at jspector. And if you would like to be a guest on this podcast at some point and get your questions answered, go to joshspector.com slash questions and you can apply to be a guest. That's about it. Thank you, Fab. Thanks everyone for your interest and I will see you next week.